Okay, it is time for our webinar today. So I'm getting us started here as people join. Um, this is our ninth in the series of webinars for small business navigating the impacts of COVID-19. I'm Barbara Coffey, Director of Economic Initiatives for the City of Tucson. We have some fantastic guest speakers today. And as always, we will take your questions as we go. So we'll definitely have a meaningful dialogue with all your questions. And this is all about how we're dealing with reopening. And feel free to enter your questions in the chat box. We'll get to as many of those as we can in our time together this afternoon. We do ask participants to stay muted and uh, that's because we have a large number of attendees, but we will record this session and make it available for everyone tomorrow. You can typically find uh, the webinar up and posted somewhere by afternoon. So you'll find links to all the previous webinars, including this one at connecttucson.com. So uh, that's the information and the housekeeping. And now let's get rolling. I'd like to introduce Felipe Garcia. He serves as the Executive Vice President of Visit Tucson, where he is responsible for developing relationships between Tucson and Mexico for our tourism industry. And he also works with the Tucson Film Office and does a lot of other things. Felipe has also worked to leverage Tucson City of Gastronomy designation, which you'll hear more about with our next speaker. Felipe is well known in our local hospitality community and can speak to the state of our tourism industry locally how it's going today and what we can expect in the months to come. It's certainly been a bumpy ride, uh, but I'll turn it over to Felipe for you to share. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Barbara, and thanks uh, everyone that's connected right now, I'm seeing a lot of familiar names on the, on the list and, and also the rest of my fellow speakers. Uh, so let me give you a little background of tourism and where we stand. And, and Barbara and I, we had a, a conversation this morning and unfortunately, Tourism industry is one of the first that gets uh, hit in this kind of economic downturns and is one of the last to recover, unfortunately. Um, in Tucson in particular, as you can imagine, as the rest of the world, we started seeing a lot of cancellations, a lot of uh, events, meetings, conventions that decided first to postpone, and that was encouraging. They were postponing to in the year, and we were hearing from local hotels saying, well, uh, this convention that was happening in April, now they're moving into September, October, uh, unfortunately, for the last quarter of this year, we're starting to see cancellations. We're starting to see now there, uh, uh, there's some risk taking. I was talking to our, some of our convention sales team members, and it seems that there's this issue of who's going to be first. Who's going to be the first group to hold a meeting or a convention and be socially acceptable or, or acceptable in these times. Um, what we're seeing again, uh, here in Tucson in particular, a few hotels decided to close. Uh, they decided to cease operations at temporary um, because, again, of just a lack of, of, uh, of, you, of, uh, of visitation. Some hotels decided to stay open. Uh, I can tell the occupancy rates in March when all of, uh, all of this started, we were going uh, almost 80%. And actually, it was amazing that March was an amazing month for Tucson. Um, I think the last number we got from Smith Travel Research that it's a company that looks at uh, occupancy and rates of hotels and that gives you the revenue per available room. Uh, March was on the bill for two. So and of course COVID happened and we saw from 75, 80% occupancy down to seven, eight percent. Uh, very low numbers. Uh, many hotels, of course, unfortunately, had to furlough most of their staff, uh, kept the skeleton crew. Some reinvented themselves, giving access to local hotel or uh, local hospital workers that they didn't want to go back home. Um, after working at the hospital, so they were trying to get into hotel rooms. So we tried again to work and find ways. Now, at VC Tucson, again, this is what we're seeing right now. Into the future, we believe, and we're starting to see data recovery based on mostly a regional market. We believe the next few months is going to be people from Phoenix, from northern Mexico that want to take a staycation or a road trip. Uh, we believe that people flying. It's going to take more time, uh, at least on the leisure side. We believe that the first, and that's the research we're seeing, the first wave of flyers are going to be business people that need to go to a business meeting. They have to travel because of corporate, but the meeting side is going to be affected. The leisure traveler, I mean, we all of us, I think that the first reaction is going to be a staycation or again, a drive market. So 
it's fascinating that we were building our strategic mark tourism plan. So uh, a few of you participated in, in, um, in a master plan for tourism that we created. And that 10 year tourism master plan was supposed to be the base for our next three year strategic plan. So we were ready to get to our board and ready to launch that program. Unfortunately, now we have to change it and we have come with a recovery plan. On the recovery plan, we're looking again next year, the next 12 months, what we have to do to return that market, looking into again that uh, dry market, a second area we see of opportunity, uh, sports. We believe that youth amateur sport competition is one of the first that are gonna come back before professional sports. Uh, another group that we see an opportunity is film. Uh, we're starting to get calls from producers and some of the individuals looking for locations. Uh, unfortunately, again, for the film industry, there was nothing filmed in the last few months. And we have now new seasons that are supposed to be coming on Earth September and October, and many don't have film their next season. So there's a need for content, and hopefully when the gates open, we'll see a flood of, of uh, production companies looking for that content and a lack of accessible space. So uh, we're developing again, we have a one year strategic plan based on getting a recovery and we're concentrating again in a local market. Um, we're starting to see, and we've been in contact with other cities around the world just to see what's happening. Like in China, we've been, uh, we've been talking to some of our peers in uh, Chengdu, China and asking them, okay, you went through the stay home to an opening, what's happening in tourism, how are you moving? And it's encouraging to see some data and some stats from uh, some countries that have already open the doors and they're maybe like three weeks ahead of us or a month ahead of us. So we're keeping an eye on those initiatives. And again, we're just ready to uh, start moving and get that regional market back to Tucson to help us that year to grow. That's fantastic. And I know that a lot of our, our panelists as well as our attendees are interested in that, right? Because it's that visitor expenditure. It's, it's how do we um, get people back uh, in in our doors, uh, eating at our restaurants and staying in our hotels. And so that's really the topic of today is how do we do that? How do we do it safely? Um, and and yet, how do we get back to business? So, um, so let's talk more on that. I'm going to remind everyone to um, ask their questions and we'll weave those into the conversation. Um, and Right now, I'll introduce our next panelist, Dr. Jonathan Mabry. Dr. Mabry was the lead author on the UNESCO City of Gastronomy application that obtained Tucson's designation as the first UNESCO City of Gastronomy in the US. He serves as the city's liaison to UNESCO and as executive director of the nonprofit that manages the designation. Jonathan has an ongoing partnership also with the UA Center, uh, McGuire Center for Entrepreneurship to provide business coaching workshops for heritage food business startups and has developed a new free assistance program for locally owned restaurants reopening and rebuilding their businesses post COVID-19 economic disruption. So Jonathan, can you start by sharing some of the things that you helped craft as best practices for our restaurant industry as this pandemic first took hold in Tucson and then share a little bit about what you're working on with your business support programs for restaurants to help them navigate this new reality. Jonathan? Hi, everybody. And um, yes, the nonprofit which manages our UNESCO designation uh, has been very active during this time. And um, uh, I've worked closely with uh, board president uh, Janos Wilder, uh, board vice president Felipe Garcia, and uh, uh, Vice President Catherine Strickland on uh, keeping uh, communications open with uh, city and county decision makers about uh, best practices that we can learn and apply from other cities. For example, I was on a uh, call like this with the other eight US UNESCO creative cities and uh, learned that San Antonio uh, which is the second city of gastronomy designated in the U.S. Uh, I learned that San Antonio uh, restaurants were being allowed to operate as pop-up groceries, uh, which is a, a brilliant idea because uh, while uh, during the, the, the period of, of uh, required closures of dining rooms, 
this offered an additional revenue lifeline for restaurants in addition to the uh, pickup and, and, and delivery uh, service. Uh, it also uh, allowed customers to uh, be able to find the food staples and, and cleaning supplies and toilet paper that were uh, sold out uh, in grocery stores. Uh, because restaurants have different supply chains than grocery stores. And um, it's also a safer, uh, it's safer for customers because instead of going to a crowded grocery store, you can uh, order online and uh, get curbside pickup of your, your groceries. So uh, I worked with, uh, the chief of staff of the city manager uh, in approaching the, uh, the, the, the city manager and then the mayor about doing something similar here. And, in, uh, and, and the mayor did uh, issue a proclamation allowing that. So that was uh, very appreciated. I've been contacted by several restaurants who said they really appreciated um, that option becoming available. I know that Todd Hanley can tell you about how the Hotel Congress has taken advantage of that option and, 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 and that was important for them. But um, that's just an example of one thing we've been doing. My next, uh, our current messaging is uh, to the city and county is uh, in San Francisco, Seattle and New York, the city councils have passed temporary caps of 15% on third party delivery uh, commission, food delivery commissions um, charged to restaurants. Currently Uber Eats, Grubhub, Postmates and, and other national delivery apps are typically charging 30% of the cost of each order, wiping out any sort of profit margin for the restaurants. So um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that our uh, city council and uh, board of supervisors will consider uh, passing uh, similar ordinances, uh, which uh, could really benefit restaurants because a lot of people are, are still keeping with, uh, they're not comfortable going uh, to do uh, on-site dining yet. And, and, and a number of local restaurants are not comfortable opening up for uh, on-site dining yet. So uh, this would be an important measure uh, to uh, help uh, our local independent restaurants, which are 63% of our um, 2,500 uh, restaurants and bars are locally owned independent businesses, which is much higher than the national average of 43%. So, uh, we need to do everything we can to support uh, locally owned independent restaurants uh, because those restaurants more than the national chain restaurants keep money circulating in our local economy. So uh, the program uh, that you mentioned, uh, we've, we've proposed a uh, program and we're seeking grant funding that would provide uh, assistance to uh, uh, local independent restaurants um, that would help them uh, recover and rebuild. And the program, uh, probably the most impactful thing that the pro program includes is helping restaurants create websites if they don't have one. And a lot of our Southside restaurants do not even have websites. Uh, so online ordering is, is pretty tricky for them. Uh, so uh, this program would help them create websites that would allow easy online ordering of food. And uh, also uh, if they have websites, uh, the program would help them upgrade their websites. The program would also provide uh, consultation services with professionals in the industry that would help them redesign their interior and outdoor spaces uh, to meet the new uh, social distancing guidelines and also uh, would assist them with uh, refocusing their marketing and social media strategies for this new world. Um, and then uh, uh, the program would also provide a, uh, 
uh, a consultant that would work one-on-one uh, -on -one with the restaurant owners to uh, customize those websites and get them just what they need. And uh, uh, we would also do uh, bilingual outreach for this program uh, to Southside restaurants. So I'll stop there and... Uh, That's fantastic. No, I appreciate that and I know that um, that the digital, you know, online presence for businesses now more than ever, so very important. And, and some might have had uh, a leg up on that and others may not have had such a strong presence. And so I think those courses are going to be uh, very important. And I know we're looking at ways, any ways that we can to support uh, businesses in that, in, in that realm, in, in the online realm, so they can all be competitive, right? And I wonder, though, before I pivot again to our next speaker, though, Jonathan, with the Pima County procedures and guidelines announced, how are restaurants and bars faring? Um, have you had some initial feedback about as they start to uh, reopen through the weekend or what are some of the concerns or, or challenges maybe still? Yes. Um, so the, the set of temporary health code uh, regulations that the county passed last week uh, includes 50% occupancy limits, protective equipment requirements, social distancing of a minimum of six feet between tables, no more than 10 people per table, daily temperature checks of not only employees, but also delivery drivers, uh, call ahead reservation systems, touchless payment methods, and public display of both physical and electronic signage, uh, and on-site and online displays of sanitizing logs. And they're required to turn away any uh, patrons exhibiting possible symptoms of COVID-19. But some of these uh, some of the county regulations are being challenged by state legislators from Southern Arizona as exceeding the governor's recent executive order uh, forbidding local jurisdictions from making regulations inconsistent with those of the governor's. Uh, and in fact, the office of the Arizona Attorney General is currently conducting an investigation. Uh, the Arizona Restaurant Association and Arizona Craft Brewers Guild also sent letters to the County Board of Supervisors citing several concerns they had have, um, such as the requirement of temperature checks of employees and delivery drivers and turning away any patrons who exhibit possible symptoms. But in response, the county administrator has proposed some amendments that will be discussed at tomorrow's Board of Supervisors meeting. And if the, those amendments are passed, uh, restaurants will not be required to have call ahead reservations staff would not be required to determine, to, to judge whether patrons are, are sick with COVID-19 and the civil penalties for violations would be reduced. Um, I, I have not uh, gotten a lot of uh, feedback yet uh, from the restaurants that have resumed uh, dining room service. Uh, I, I will be uh, kind of polling them soon. Uh, so I hope to be able to uh, to have some, some, some information about that next time, but uh, uh, I don't at this time. Well, that's a perfect segue for our next speaker uh, because I think maybe we'll get a nice viewpoint. Uh, Jesus Bonillas is co-founder of The Common Group, a local development company that has been focused on investment on the south side of Tucson. One of his most recent projects was the complete overhaul of American Meat Market, which was a staple in Tucson for decades. His team reimagined and reopened it as cultural food court that you know, American Eat Company, which opened its doors two years ago. Jesus is a graduate of Sunnyside High School and local Tucsonan with deep community roots. Jesus, welcome. And I would love for you to share with us about how you have navigated the pandemic and what you are facing now as reopening is here, as we're inviting customers back to our restaurants, talk about your experience, what you have done to survive and what you're doing now to reopen. Well, I'll, I'll start by saying thanks for, for inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure to, to be amongst you all. And I feel like in one way, shape or form, we're all in the, in the business of hospitality or tourism or restaurants, right? Um, yeah, so it has been challenging, you know, to say the least. Um, 
I will say that I am not officially, I have not officially survived yet. We are still fighting like heck to get, to get the business uh, to a point where, where it's sustainable, you know, not even turning a profit, but just sustainable. So those, those things have been really challenging for us. Um, aside from, from all the precautions that I'm sure you see at grocery stores and um, some restaurants, you know, we've, we've put up plexiglass, uh, uh, sneeze guards, um, hand sanitizing stations throughout the restaurant. Um, we have brought in several new chemicals that help us disinfect specifically for the COVID-19. Um, we have employees doing nothing but wiping down service, um, different uh, multi-touch surfaces throughout the day, um, which is an added cost um, when, you know, in a, in a very unpredictable uh, world, you know. Um, I feel like the new benchmark um, is going to be somewhat costly uh, to maintain, um, especially if, if we want to make sure that the, the environment is safe. So we have to take every single precaution. Um, tomorrow we're going to be installing touch-free um, faucets, touch-free paper towel dispensers um, as uh, you know, additional uh, portion of our upgrades. Um, we are still working with our POS system to implement, um, or I should say the, the provider of our POS system to implement a touchless pay. I guess you have to have a certain ability on your credit card to do that and not everybody has that ability. Um, but we are taking precautions when we do accept cash. Um, we are limiting the touching of, of certain items. Um, other than that, you know, um, there's just a lot of unknowns on our side, you know, on, on, the, on the perception side of our customers. And um, it is nice to be back in business again. You know, it, it's a different world. It feels different. Um, the energy feels different in the food court. You know, um, I feel like people are overall just more cautious. Um, and it's, it's not the same, you know? Um, so I, I don't know what, I don't know what the future holds. You know, it, it is a little, uh, it's a little nerve wracking to say the least. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate your sharing your perspective. I, I, I agree there's a different energy and I think it's going to take us a while. And, but you've made some good points about the work you're doing to make sure people feel safe because I think that's that's part of it restoring consumer confidence making sure that customers feel safe coming to your business that's on your shoulders and it's a big lift um, and I wonder from your perspective there are concerns from some about opening too soon and some that may may be waiting what's your experience with that um, you know a couple days in I mean how when did you open and 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 what were your thoughts as you pursued a reopening strategy well I think if we can back up and really look at the layers of perception um, I think and Felipe may be able to answer this question but I think two or three years ago restaurants surpassed grocery stores in annual sales for the first time in history of the United States. Um, I feel like restaurateurs are under a little bit of a different scrutiny than grocery stores. Um, maybe because restaurants are still perceived as a luxury, whereas some people use restaurants for as a necessity. They don't cook, they don't have time, they don't even keep food in the refrigerator. You know, they're just very busy people. Um, and maybe because of that, we've been under this level of scrutiny that's been difficult. But if you compare it to the other option of buying food, which is the grocery store, um, they are by far are offering far less uh, safety precautions than, than restaurants are required to. Their only form of social distancing is when you go to pay and that's it congregating around the deli case, the butcher case, vegetables. There are no social distancing measures in place for any of those things. Um, people are touching fruit, people are touching the glass surfaces and nobody's doing anything about it. You know, they're, they're skating under the, the radar um, because they have a gentleman, one gentleman in front that says, uh, he has a vest that says safety coordinator and he has gloves on 
and they have X's on the floors at the, at the cashier stations, you know? So it's a little bit frustrating that they are creating an environment that is far worse and less safe than what we are creating currently, you know? Um, and I think that people need to take a big look at if you are going to go out to eat, whether you're going to go buy groceries to cook at your home or go out for a meal, if you really compare apples to apples, restaurants are far safer than any grocery store in Tucson, you know? And, and I feel like that, that narrative needs to be said. Anytime I've had an opportunity to speak on the subject, um, I have always brought those points up. Um, if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, you should see the <laughs> lines and the congregating around the plants and all of the outdoor uh, furniture. I mean, there is no social distancing whatsoever. So to the people that, you know, to the other restaurateurs who feel it is too soon, um, you know, that's, that's a matter of preference at the end of the day. You know, if, if they feel that, that it is too much, they don't have to open. But um, I do feel like there are tools and there's enough information out there for restaurants to safely open and be a healthy alternative for people to eat. Now, I appreciate that. And I hear what you're saying. I ventured out a little bit this weekend and, and I felt like it was Christmas at Home Depot. I mean, the parking lot was full to the edge. Um, unusual and scary, but again, wearing masks, all those things, those are things we need to think about. One more question before I go to our next and, and final speaker on the panel, but elimination of buffet style service, salad bars and all that. How do you, how did you make that change? Was that something you had to deal with? Because I would think the concept, you know, you, you made some adaptations. How has that been for you? Currently, uh, prior to COVID, we didn't have any buffet style restaurants. Um, there was one that was uh, late summer, early fall, who was in business, but no, no longer in business. Um, so in regards to the buffet style, we haven't had any issues um, from that side. But I would say, you know, that is definitely, uh, if I was a 100% buffet restaurant, I would probably be speaking differently. But um, luckily for us, we haven't had any issues uh, with that particular item. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Let's, we're going to move on and we're going to keep taking questions. So do uh, feel free to put those in the chat box. I see Felipe has been answering uh, a couple questions. And so we'll, we'll talk more. But finally in our lineup today, we have Todd Hanley, proprietor of Hotel Congress and Maynard's Market and Kitchen in downtown Tucson. So Todd, I would love to hear your perspective. How has it been for you at your downtown properties? I know you've done some creative things to pivot at the outset of the pandemic. We heard Jonathan talk a little bit about some of the things that you might have been able to take advantage of. Tell us how it's been, what you're doing now in order to bring people back through the doors. Todd? Well, first off, I, I just wanna say thank you, Barbara, but also Jesus, uh, just kudos, it's unbelievably well said I mean I can't say enough how impressed I was with that perspective I I struggled with the decision to wait until the end of May and it's in part because of just logistical challenges that we had in front of us but again Jesus I just think you just hit the nail right on the head brother I mean just an absolute home run everybody's perception has to be tempered with facts and sometimes facts can often be misinterpreted and manipulated for the betterment of whatever your agenda is. And so kudos to you, Jesus, for taking a leap of faith and kind of helping pave the way because I'll be honest with you, I didn't want to pave the way for this particular situation. So I do appreciate that effort. Um, so for us, I mean, it's been a struggle because we're a hotel, we're a nightclub, we're basically three restaurants and a private event facility. So as of March 17th, 98% of our revenue dried up. I mean, literally 98%. So we have been operating on three to 4% of our operating revenue since March 17th. It just so happens to be St. Patty's Day, one of my favorite holidays. So I'll never forget that not so fun holiday. But we did have the fortunate, you know, kind of, I guess, innovative luck, if you will, of creating a market online that did keep approximately 25 salaried employees and employed for the, for the last six weeks. Uh, that did not help out tremendously because we laid off 185 
uh, 200 total employees between part-time and full-time. So, but the, the, the market itself was an interesting innovation. Uh, I will tell you that it's starting to dry up because as everybody's feeling more comfortable or whatever your level of more comfortable is, they're going out and, and we see it. It's, it's quickly becoming a, not a very feasible long-term project for us at the hotel, but we do hope to actually move it over to Maynard's in an online farmer's market that specifically focuses on local. Uh, so for us, the survival was the reality of unemployment for a lot of our staff, applying for the PPP, and then hiring people back to start the process of getting our business back to a place where we could even feel comfortable. Uh, we are a 100-year-old hotel at Hotel Congress, and we're a uh, 105-year-old train depot. So there's always nuanced challenges within historic buildings, even the one that was built out beautifully by the city of Tucson. There's still challenges to that particular aspect of, of, our, of our business model. I, I guess, man, I would say that for us, the, the future is complex because we have still six moving parts. We have an nightclub that won't go back inside anytime soon. We're not even thinking about that until the fall. We have a restaurant that will open up, but only on the plaza. Uh, Maynard's Market will open up as a kind of to-go, sit on the patio. So we're going to phase everything in over the next couple weeks here. Uh, unofficially, we'll open up on May 28th. I haven't made that official announcement because I'm just wanting to have a few more ducks in the row. And as Jonathan so eloquently articulated, the health department has been great. They've put out some very strict guidelines that I've thoughtfully kind of revisited because of input from the community. So we appreciate that. But those aspects are in and of itself a challenge when you're trying to open up. And, and I can only imagine how difficult it is for Jesus with his multiple concepts, because I'm in the same position on many levels with a fast casual market, a restaurant you know, at the Cup Cafe, uh, so there's a lot of moving parts for us. The hotel becomes a whole nother challenge that is still kind of a, a, a dicey, I guess, topic to, to navigate, if you will, because, you know, we have a lobby, we have a bathroom. So there's, there's many, many aspects to our business that still need to be figured out. And, and we're struggling with decisions, quite frankly. We're having very heated discussions to make sure that no stone is unturned in terms of what is the best for our business obviously staying within the local and state and, and federal guidelines. So, I mean, I, I will say that for me, it, some points that I've taken away from this as it relates to the pandemic would be keeping it simple. You know, what you do well, stick with what you do well. Uh, innovation is great, but sometimes innovation can get in the way of making, you know, it look like it's going to work when it's just maybe a little bit outside of your comfort zone. So we're we're finding to find that balance is a bit of a struggle. Uh, I also think cooperation, as, as we've all seen, the City of Gastronomy as an example, the Southern Arizona Arts uh, Council, uh, I think it's what it's called. Everybody's looking to be more innovative about how they can help the community. I really, really caution everybody in terms of working together. Don't reinvent the wheel because ultimately somebody is out there that's done it. Hopefully they can help us do it a little bit better. And, and I think we're all wanting to find a, a niche, find a way to be sustainable long-term. And I hope to see more cooperation as we move forward. So I guess just touching upon that, I was taking some notes down here just to kind of make sure that I didn't miss anything. But for us, and I think Jesus can attest to this, the experience still has to be a part of the overall culinary experience in, in the sense that you can't just come back and feel like you're you're in a you know kind of a overly regulated situation because then it's not comfortable so how do you find that balance in and of itself is a, a, a topic that I still struggle with because I'm very much that analog type of person I want the human interaction I want the human elements to make it make a difference to go along with the food and the culture that we represent so I'm going to struggle with that as we open up and try to find that balance so we're safe and, and taking the necessary precautions. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll end by saying what Jonathan and Jesus have said about all of the safety precautions. It's more important for me that we can actually execute those and, and to have that dedicated sanitizer 
that dedicated sanitizer has to be the one that understands how critical they are, just like the dishwasher. It becomes a real challenge to really motivate and make sure that the systems are done, not just are in place, but completed perfectly. Because uh, as my wife's client told her, she went out to dinner and, and one of the restaurants, it was just a little bit unsafe from their perspective. But the perspective was the, the spotlight was so much on them. To, to Jesus's point, the scrutiny becomes almost too much to, to handle. So how do you medi mitigate that? How do you balance that? And I mean, we're all going to have to figure this out on the fly. I appreciate that. I'm going to ask a couple questions um, that are coming through. They're starting to light up. Todd, what kind of demographics did you see using the market when you opened that aspect? Uh, pretty pretty varied, honestly. I would say if I would, I don't have like the specifics, but I would say that it definitely skewed probably 50 to 65, but I definitely believe there was that portion that was, you know, 28, 30 to, to 45, but definitely you could sense uh, people that weren't comfortable going to grocery stores were challenged with the, the supply chain distribution. I mean, it, we, we had people coming out to pick up their, their groceries just to have a level of human experience, which is pretty sad when it comes to you're trying to minimize the human experience. But uh, I think it was mostly skewing probably 50 to you know, 65 ish. Mm -hmm. And what about just generally downtown, uh, the kind of activity? I'm sure it has seemed very quiet for a while, but there's yeah. also, you know, what are you seeing right now? Not, not much, to be quite frank with you. It's still, it still feels slow. I mean, it's definitely more than what it was. I've been told Fourth Avenue feels like there's a little bit of life in it. Obviously, uh, university was probably overly busy because of the graduation weekend, but downtown still seems to kind of be kind of inching back. I'm, I'm not even too sure of, a, of restaurants that are open at this point. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not paying too close attention, which probably I should be doing a better job of. Well, you have your hands full, as all of you do, if you're running a business and you're running many businesses. So we appreciate you. Thank you for being a leader in what's happening. Hey, Seuss, I want to come back to you with a question. What level of business have you seen? This is from Casey. What level of business have you seen after reopening in comparison to um, re with the reduced occupancy, I guess, levels? Um, so... It's interesting because the county did allow up to 50% in occupancy, but we spent about four hours doing several different types of layouts in our restaurant. And I was lucky to hit 25% occupancy. Um, that's with the six foot table separation. Um, you know, obviously the elimination of some of our joint seating, that's all gone. But we hit 25% with that, that being said, um, we're only open five days a week now, Wednesday through Sunday. Um, we did 30% of our previous pre-corona numbers, if you will. Um, we did 30% of those normal sales for the week. Okay. Which is still, still underwater. <laughs> right, right. But that could be encouraging to some that are listening. And so I think all these experiences are good to hear. And sometimes it's just like, we want to know if we've, are experiencing the norm or something normal and this is and certainly a new normal um, there's a question here about um, local restaurants this is from Teresa I heard that local restaurant may be creating or selling meal prep kits coupled with live instruction or classes from the restaurant on how to make the meals as a customer would experience within the restaurant are other restaurants planning to introduce that model to enjoy meals in addition to takeout if anyone has Awesome. I'd love to speak to that because we actually have that on a, we'll call it midterm plan for Maynard's market. We won't be opening Maynard's kitchen until probably late June, if at all, you know, maybe early July, seeing how it kind of plays out. But uh, phase one for us would be opening up Maynard's market to Jesus's point five days a week, opening our online farmer's market that hyper focuses on hyper local and then once we get that up and running, the meal kit is, is something that we're very excited about, but there's logistics and costs associated with it that you wanna be thoughtful about as you try to take on new business models, such as 
a farmer's market take and bake, if you will. But the meal kit is as a lot of, there's a lot of multinational or at least international companies that are doing it. Blue Apron as an example from what I've been told. But I believe that that's something that businesses will look to try and pick up on as they start to see themselves coming back out of hibernation. Uh, but that's that's a very interesting point because uh, we, we just met about that and that's going to be probably sometime in June once we get a few weeks under our belt. But the meal kits do seem like a very value added aspect to a restaurant that can actually execute that type of business model. Great. Barbara, uh, Todd mentioned earlier about best practices in Mexico. A uh, Carlos Red de Mola, he's a news anchor. He developed a program where we local farmers that were in challenging because they had nowhere to put their products. So he developed meal kits based on local farmers that are going to be losing their uh, their production because of lack of customers. And God, he sold that in an hour. Uh, and it was a meal kit partnered with the chef. I think it's a great idea. Something to learn from as a best practice. That's great. Okay. Or go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just, I mean, I, for me, you know, I sit on the board with uh, Hayes, or excuse me, uh, Felipe and Jonathan. I see, if I could, you know, aspire to say this, a critical next step in our local economy, improving upon the supply chain from the local farmer, the local rancher, the local farmer's market vendor, getting them into the economic cycle that the restaurants have available. For me, that is, if if we can't come out of this pandemic with a little better system in place, keeping our local farmers, our local ranchers, all of our local businesses that are supporting the supply chain for foods to either restaurant or direct to consumer, we have to come out stronger on the end because to Felipe's point, if you can't get beef because you know someplace in Nebraska isn't processing beef, well, that's where we should be utilizing our resources within 60 to 90 miles and they're there not to maybe sustain a, a restaurant, in, but those businesses that have that model, they should be looking at that. And I, I mean, boy, if I had another 12 hours in a day, I'd try to crack that nut with Jonathan and the rest of this team over the next couple of weeks, because I believe strongly that our local supply chain has to come out of this stronger. That's excellent. And I appreciate that. And Felipe, I wanted to go back to you just to restate when Jane asked the question about addressing tax credits to film companies in the state, if that would become a <laughs> I know you had a response there that you were hoping that's the case for Arizona, that you're working with a binational panel looking into an Arizona Sonora fund. Do you have anything to add about, about the, the film and tax credits program? We, we've been working with a coalition statewide to develop a jobs program to hopefully uh, entice more production here in town, of course. Uh, with this happening, that's going to be on hold. But in the meantime, we're working in a binational program between uh, mainly Sonora, Arizona, with an Institute of Chicago and Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Madrid, looking into some uh, creative ways that we can learn lessons from this pandemic and come with great opportunities. And one is really to film, one thought is related to food, food supply um, regionally between uh, the state of Sonora, Arizona. Uh, so again, uh, yes, we, we hope so. With the film industry, it's we'll try. We're, we're, we're trying to set up a, a fund and see if we can go and compete with New Mexico. Well, I think it would be, you know, it seems like it would be ideal for film companies anyway to want to come to Tucson right now and get out of those major cities where they might, you know, they're usually operating or traditionally have operated. So maybe that's a, a selling point for us. Absolutely. Um, and if I can share, Barbara, just really fast, a, 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 a uh, document just to let you know about what Americans are trusting right now. Um, so this is a document that has been, I don't know if you can see the screen here, um, perceived safety of traveler activities. And uh, this is a weekly report that a, that a company called Destination Analyst, it's publishing every week, every Monday. So you can see again what people are feeling comfortable in the US uh, this week, this is the, the, the number left, Sorry, the, the, the light blue, non-team outdoor, road trips, visiting friends and family, shopping, hotel, restaurants. And as we talking and Jesus was mentioning, that perception of restaurants is still there for Americans. But the good news is, again, if you look in this side, we're starting to, we, we tailor to that group. Outdoor recreation, road trips, 
uh, Tucson and Southern Arizona, I think this is the perfect place for a recovery. Fantastic. I, I will say, if you don't mind, Barbara, may I, may I ask, add one thing? Yes. So for the last two years we've been open, um, we see on average about 19,000 people uh, a month. Um, our average check was about $12.30 per person. This opening week, even though the numbers were significantly less, average check was $16.35, mm -hmm. which I think what's really awesome is this Tucson as a community and, and wanting to spend money with local businesses. I think that is one key factor in this going up and, and you know, the average spend per person. I think that is really awesome. Mm -hmm. And something to be said about uh, just the overall narrative of how important it is to, to spend local. I would agree with that. And that's awesome to hear. Uh, your numbers on that to really put our finger on it, right? Sometimes we can kind of get the feel, but it's good to have the metrics and to yeah. see how we're doing. So there are a number of other questions. How about comments on the use of parking? Uh, Mike is asking about, uh, would you use your parking lot for seating? Does, is that helpful or uh, any space for patio dining? Um, and is is the weather here, especially now that we're in the summertime, is that an issue? What's going to happen as you need extended space? Any comments on that? I mean, I could comment. We're fortunate because we have an outdoor plaza with the Hotel Congress and then an outdoor patio. I know that Janos is going to repurpose his parking lot into a dining space. So, and, and to, to the credit of the health or Pima County, they've loosened up the restrictions on essentially what can be used as a dining experience. So for us, we're gonna be only outside dining. So anybody that has that dining space outside obviously should be taking full advantage of it. Uh, we did actually, it, our general manager took a poll, just informal mind you, on Facebook and, and a vast majority of the people that will be coming out to dine are feeling more comfortable outside than inside with ob for obvious reasons. So it's, it's pretty important. Uh, the challenge is, is it's going to be basically sunrise dining and sunset dining because outside between the times of noon and three, maybe a little, well, actually noon and five, quite frankly, will be probably a little bit challenging, but I think that's critical. And, and it's just still has that aspect of making sure that you have that social distance, but also making sure that they can have an experience that's not on the plaza where it's 125 degrees. So it'll, it'll be an interesting dynamic to see how that looks in June, July, and August. So in your mind, is there anything else the city can do to make that easier on you for expanding those dining areas? I know we've talked about extensions into the right of way. Um, is there anything else that, that would make it easy? Oh, that's a great question. Could you install a misting system? That would be fantastic. Uh, no, I, I guess no. I, I mean, off the top of my head, I think you probably just what's happened with the, the loosening of some of the regulations around you know, not so traditional dining spaces was a good step. I think if there is a way for the cities to help, and Jesus probably could speak to this as well, is you know, PPEs are difficult. We need to make sure that we have all of our staff protected because they're coming to work and, and because they don't have a choice, we need to put them in a position to be protected as much as possible and and again that extra cost of us of a dedicated sanitation specialist those those costs add up so I, I know that there's you know probably too much red tape in in the city to maybe support the ppes that can help make sure that all the, the restaurants have the ability to to afford what they can to make sure this the staff are safe but that's a pipe dream i bet <laughs> well no these are important things to consider you had a Someone had a comment? Yeah, uh, Barbara, I wanted to ask, is the city looking at um, at least temporarily loosening the um, and streamlining the uh, process for um, temporary revocable easements uh, to extend into city right of way? Yes, we have had some conversations with our partners in planning and development. Um, and in transfer and with transportation about those kinds of, of, of relief efforts. And I think there's some um, 
there's some will there. So we want to make it as easy as possible. I'm not sure if there is some uh, approvals that we have to get in place or not. I don't know if I have someone on, uh, in our attendant, in our audience that can address that, but I know I'll, um, you'll be hearing from us as we firm up that opportunity, but I think if you're making requests, you're going to find that Planning and Development Services is going to work with you uh, to come up with some creative ways uh, to find that solution for you so you can get more people, you know, served during this time. I, I would say, in, I'm sorry, Barbara, um, in addition to that, um, zoning is going to have to, or, you know, should loosen up some of their guidelines to allow for more dining, alcohol consumption, um, and activity licenses. Because I know every time we did an outdoor event, we had to apply for an extension of premise to the city of Tucson. And that took, you know, 45 to 60 days for the approval. Um, I do know that if they were to grant those things ahead of time and fast track a lot of that, because at the end of the day, um, even if we were to fill every single seat in our restaurant um, at a 50% capacity, we still are going to run short on our break even. So if we can subsidize what we have to minimize in the dining room with outdoor usability of our parking lot, and kind of have some of those things already available. And I think the big thing to help local restaurants and business owners is let people know, publish some sort of a fast track guideline for restaurateurs and for business owners to see what tools they can use because not all business owners are thinking out of, out of the box like that. But if the city can kind of be proactive in that sense, I think that that'll go a long way just with the overall morale of the entrepreneur in town. No, I appreciate that. And I think Jane with Maingate confirms, we, we have been working with merchants on sidewalk dining uh, and providing that you still allow for some ADA uh, through way um, and uh, you, can get some, you can get some relief. So we will, to your point, it, we need to make it quick. We need to, make, we need to react quickly. Um, so a couple of other things and Jonathan, maybe you have some ideas how can we best help this is angelica how can we best help our restaurants as customers to promote their business social media drive by meal prep parties groups gift cards donations what's most helpful as we try to reach out to um to customers again thoughts of, that you that's a great question i would think that uh the single most helpful thing in addition to uh you know, uh, purchasing uh, meals, whether it's pickup or takeout or uh, the meal kits what, what, or, or dining in, the next most helpful thing would be to share through social media uh, your experience uh, that, that it felt comfortable to you and that you felt safe and that the local restaurants really need it. So I, I think that the public can really help um, sort of share the and, 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 and amplify the the message that um, it's safe and uh, the local restaurants uh, are knocking it out of the park in terms of uh, meeting the safe the new safety guidelines. And uh, to Jesus's point, it's it's safe. It, 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 rest, restaurants now are one of the cleanest, safest uh, places to uh, get food in the community. That's great advice. I really do think that that gives us all a proactive approach, right? As consumers, when we go out and then share our experiences, how powerful that is, and how important that is to your fellow business folks that you. Uh, that really are our friends and family in the community. And so I'm so, I'm grateful um, to hear your stories and hear your suggestions on all of that. So there was a, a note from Charlene. Yes, we've seen the Forbes article that indicates Tucson is one of, in one of the top 10 uh, cities to come back post pandemic. So that's great. And we shared that as quickly as we saw it. Um, because it's it's important to share that messaging, especially when you're in the role that I'm in and Felipe, when we're when we're out there recruiting people to come to our area, to our city, whether for business or pleasure, uh, and and all of that goes with that. We have to talk about 
uh, what a great option we are, what a great location we are. And we love that when we get those accolades and we can share that story. It contributes to the message. And then hopefully, again, that puts people in our hotels, puts people in our restaurants and on the streets again. So um, I think our mid-tier cities, so here's my comment. I think our mid-tier cities across the country will fare well um, in that regard, because I think you've seen the, the challenge and really the sad situations that are happening in our most intense urban areas across the globe, really, but definitely in our country. And so people may be looking for relief from that, and they and this may be another reason to look at Tucson. And so I really think we're the right size and we're poised for that opportunity. So we'll keep sharing that story as well. There is a question here also um, to me about the small business grants that have been announced. I know that uh, you're probably referring to what mayor and council discussed at their last meeting, uh, which was an additional allocation uh, as part of the Somos Uno Resiliency Fund efforts, uh, $5.5 million for grants that would also include grants to workers and families, as well as small business and also nonprofits. And the question is, when can we see those applications? So I will tell you that we are working on the specifics of that and working on guidelines. Um, it's not quite final. Council has to look at it one more time. But as soon as, as, as that happens, you'll hear about it. We'll send out emails. We'll make sure that you have the application process in front of you. So I appreciate uh, that, and, that question. And, and I know it's not the best answer just yet, but we're getting there. Um, and, and you can rest assured your mayor and council are trying to do everything they can to, to help with financial assistance, to help with technical assistance, to be sure that equal opportunity uh, is addressed and that barriers are removed. And so you, you have people that are very concerned and want a fast recovery. So I'm, I'm thrilled that, uh, that we have that team in place. Um, so any other questions from our attendees? You still have the opportunity to put that in the chat box in our remaining minute. I will say Felipe added a good report uh, that he shared with the perspective of what's happening in China related to travel. And I can, I can bet that it's insights about how, they're, how they are reopening or maybe how things are, are moving forward. Um, I can tell you that there will be a new normal, right? You're going to get on an airplane and, and maybe uh, you'll have uh, to wear a mask. Many airlines are requiring some guidelines um, and they may also have spacing. Um, and I know I booked my first flight for July. Uh, it is the end of July, but I booked one. So there you go. You can take advantage of, of the opportunity to, to think positive and think we'll be back out there. Um, but I, you know, we're going to have we're gonna have a new way of doing business. So I appreciate everyone today being part of, uh, of this process. I, final question was, will that grant application be available in Spanish? Yes, all of our applications will be. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can go to connecttucson.com right now. And as you start to look for things, you can toggle for the Spanish language, but you'll start seeing all of our postings with PDFs and any of our documents translated in Spanish. We're doing a much more aggressive approach to making sure that we have uh, both English and Spanish language uh, materials available. So uh, appreciate, again, appreciate our panelists and I'll close it up by saying thank you uh, to each one of you um, and for spending the time with us today. We will have uh, this recording available tomorrow. You can also reach out directly to, to me or call the City of Tucson Economic Initiative Small Business Hotline for any assistance at 520-837-4100 and check for updates on connecttucson.com. Direct loan program applications are still being accepted through midnight, May 26th at bdfc.com. So if you have not applied, please go there. Hopefully um, we'll get some more funding out to you then quickly and, and we'll be fighting for more allocations along the way. I just want you to know that. Um, with that, I will close our time together and we will miss next Monday. We will take our a hiatus, but we're gonna come back in two weeks. So we will have Memorial Day off um, and hopefully you'll enjoy uh, the benefit of that day uh, out and about again. Uh, but we'll come back then in two weeks and resume because I think there is still a fair amount of 
of discussion and opportunity for us all. So again, thank you all. Have a great afternoon.